The Legion, Season 2, Episode 7 Thoughts. This episode is called Chapter 15. Another episode of Love. Spoilers for everything x -Men leading up to and including this episode. The episode is rated TVMA, so will this video be? Let's dive right in. So, yeah, we get the... the, the yeah, the narrator talks some about moral panic, and I do appreciate that they... One of the things they use, you know, in addition to witch hunts, which, yeah, you know, before Trump tr tried to redefine that to mean, you know, I don't like when I'm being held accountable, yeah, you know, obviously witchcraft in reality is not a real thing. You know, if you actually look at it, some of it was legit just like, patriarchal dudes being too insecure to uh, accept, you know, some, some feminism. So, you know, sadly, not that much has changed. You know, Pat Robertson said, oh, no, you know, modern feminism is still witchcraft. But the... In so many words. But, yeah, in addition to literal witch hunts, the episode also brings up the moral panic surrounding comic books, which... Yeah, sadly, that was a real thing. A bunch of people were convinced that comic books were, you know, the, there's that really excellent image where, you know, basically, like, the children are essentially, like, worshipping the yellow-eyed devil. And I love the, the point made that, you know, who is, who is more terror, or what is more terrifying, fear or the frightened, and we go for, you know, and, and the, the, like, uh, let's see, I guess they're not Amish, are they? Pil pilgrims, whatever, you know, something like that. They go from, from, you know, looking at the, the witch that has been hanged to looking directly at the camera. You know, everyone is looking directly at us. Very, very creepy, very effective. Love it. Let's see. And then Farouk... <laughs> manages to find a way to communicate with future Sid in just, yeah, amazing. And, yeah, great scene of the, you know, conversation between, you know, the, yeah, in the, in the astral plane, Farouk and, and David talking, and this thing of, you know, Farouk says that, David, deep down, hated Amy. You know, he he wished that he could hurt her. And David insists that's not the same. You know, these these thoughts do not translate into actions. And I do appreciate because that is an important, you know, discussion. Because after a while, you might. You know, if, if you if you sit with a really awful thought for a very long time, you might end up, just in small ways at first, doing things that actually hurt people that, you know, you, you don't accept that you're hurting them, you know, kind of. So, yeah. I quite appreciate, you know, there's that uh, phrase, uh, what you think eventually becomes what you do. And, let's see. Yeah, it was quite fun when, you know, by the end, Farouk is like, you know what, fine, back to the kiddie table. And, yeah, David was thinking, oh, this is, you know, it's time for the psychic duel. And then he actually finds himself eating with these two children who, you know, one of them's like, who is he? And the other's one, like, just ignore him, maybe he'll go away. Which tells me that they're conservative. And I love the transition between, so he looks through the keyhole and sees Amy, and he's like, oh, I gotta get in there. And then he turns around and she's right there, you know, he's inside the room that he was thinking about getting into. And, yeah, you know, he tries to tell her, I didn't mean the things that I was thinking, you know, which, 
And I really appreciate because that is a thing that, like, a lot of people find themselves harboring negative thoughts towards people who are close to them. You know, it is, you know, there there is a, there is a reason that sometimes the people that hurt us the most are the people closest to us, and that is, of course, that they're in melee range. So, yeah, sometimes there, there might, you know, some people might harbor negative thoughts towards them, but if they come face to face with that person and they, you know, it, it kind of feels like he thinks that she heard what Farouk said, which, yeah, I mean, he didn't move from, David didn't move from the room. Farouk and the now also the kids did, so maybe Amy was privy to, to all that was said. And, you know, now he feels terrible. He's trying to convince her, you know, I would never hurt her. I would never hurt you. I would never, you know. And, you know, she starts laughing in Farouk's voice. Very creepy. Very nicely done. And, yeah, the conversation between Sid and David about future Sid. Once again, my hat comes off. Rachel Keller as Sid nails these deadpan lines, you know, the, the, yeah, the deadpan delivery, you know, this thing of, I, I just, you know, just don't want you to be jealous. Why would I be jealous of myself? You know, just, like, fantastic. Just incredible, spot-on delivery. And, and yeah, you know, eventually they do realize, yeah, I mean, maybe there is something, maybe there is a little bit of, of jealousy yeah, and then we get to the part where the Sid of the future and Farouk communicate. And yeah, this thing of like, oh, the, the, you know, we thought Farouk had to be stopped, but he might actually be the one who, you know, he might be the hero of the, the future. And, yeah, very compelling with Lenny. You know, so, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that play out. I'm not 100% certain who exactly... I mean, it really appears from this scene that they weren't already working together. So her saying that to him, you know, appears to be genuine. Rather than like, you know, oh, she's she's afraid of him and they're already working together, so she's gonna try to tell him what he wants, what she thinks he wants to hear. Really compelling when Lenny is, you know, she snaps her fingers and she hears, I guess feels, the pain that Amy went through. And she, yeah, so Sid comes up to the, the door and you know, opens the little thing, and Lenny, I love this character so much, just looks her in the eyes and is like, it's kind of weird how both of us were inside David. I mean, mentally. Of all the things that you could say, you know, just, yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and we see more of uh, Tonami's delusions. He imagines the Vermilion coming to attack him, and he spreads the the illness to some of the others. I love when Clark is walking down the hallway, and the, there are three Vermilion behind him. And every time, like he, at one point he just straight up closes his eyes, opens them, and they, they move a little bit closer, and they change how they're standing, but they only, it's, it's, they only, except for the very end, where they, where they're close enough to get to him at once. Other than that, they only move when he isn't looking at them, which is also just very inherently creepy. And, you know, there are, like, mythical beings that only move when you're, you're not looking directly at them. Let's see. 
yeah, good scene between David and, and future Sid talking about, you know, yeah, the, the, he finds that he simply can't help Farouk, which, yeah, we can understand. And, yeah, uh, David finds himself in front of a hallway with, you know, I mean, hypothetically, he could just walk down this path, but he'd be walking on eggshells the whole time. And, yeah, really love the <laughs> vermilion versus the, the infected, uh, you know, this thing of they analyze, you know, okay, so what was it, like, high blood pre higher blood pressure and, and like, yeah, some, something, and they, they estimate, okay, this is definitely, there's going to be a physical fight. Probability of winning? 86% or something like, or 68%, something like that. And, and you know, Carrie is like, sure, are, they sure are cocky. And I appreciate the the um, tactics employed. Tony fires the, the gun at a bunch of them before Carrie starts uh, chopping at them with the the X. And yeah, very, very cool when, you know, once they're, let's see, it's, it's Clark and Sid, once they're face to face with the, the, uh, with Fuki, Fukuyama, I forget his title, you know, the, the, yeah, they make him take off the, the basket, probably because they think it looks silly, and they don't see his face, which with the audience see, they see the, the monster, the, the bad idea that, uh, you know, which, yeah, one can understand how, you know, yeah, seeing that thing under the, you know, yeah. Right, another thing, um, I liked when uh, Farouk was like, take off your mask. You know, and, and I think it's David, he says it too, he's like, I don't wear a mask, and, and focus like, everybody wears a mask, which, again, is one of those things, like, Farouk has done some terrible things, but this episode does make me wonder if maybe he is, at least in part, the key to, to, to you know, good guy victory, and the thing is, you know, it, we all wear masks, is the kind of thing, you know, I, I've, I'm not 100% certain what the English equivalent is, but in Danish we have a phrase that translates to thieves believe everyone steals, you know. So, so yeah, of course Farouk would think everyone wears a mask because he wears one. He hides his intention. But there is some truth to, you know, everybody is... Nobody shows everyone around them everything about them. Let's see, but but yeah, um, and David thankfully gets there in time before Clark shoots Fukuyama, and we have this great little moment of you know David teleports in, and then he freezes Clark, and he turns the gun into like a, a um, cleaning kind of thing, you know, that was yeah. You know, that's, that's de-escalation. That's a very effective de-escalation. And he pulls the, the little bugs out of them. But then Tonami, you know, it's like vomiting up this nasty black ooze and eating the chicken that Needy wasn't supposed to. Her mom bought that. Anyway, um, let's see... I love when like Carrie sees the 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 big bug in the in the hallway and she you know it's Carrie she's already always ready to fight so you know she's she's preparing to attack this thing and David shows up and then he says bad idea which is both a description of her plan you know, it's a bad idea to attack the giant bug. 
I think she could probably take it, but, you know, it's not necessary to risk it. But it also describes the bug, you know, it, from the start, from the first time we saw it, it's been described by the narrator as, a, a, I don't think he used the, those exact words, but bad idea was like a sin, ir irrational thought or something like that, you know. And, yeah, and the, you know, they realize Tonami is, is dying, so they take him to the mainframe. Which I think means he's about to become one in a million. And yeah, David manages to get to the, the bug and bring it into, uh, you know, the astral plane or something. And I kind of love that he, like, he gives it a chance. You know, it's like, do you understand me? And it's like growling and roaring. It's like, I guess you don't understand me, you know, and he explains, this is a bad time, it's not your fault, well, okay, it is your fault, you know, just, yeah, I, I, I kind of love, because he's essentially facing down a gigantic cockroach, you know, and I'm, I'm sure the, the CGI team, overworked and underpaid, are, are very, very, relieved when he finally, you know, just explodes it there at the end. I appreciate that they're, you know, this is as good CG as you can accomplish with that amount of time on that kind of budget and, the, and such. I wish they didn't show it quite so much. I think a lot would have been accomplished if they, I'm not expecting them to do the entire thing practically, but if for the for the shots where what we're focusing on is that it's like angry and roaring and growling and such, if they could just make like a mask or a puppet or something and and get a close up of that instead of us seeing because it's never completely photorealistic. It's always just slightly uncanny. But yeah, um he gives it a chance. It you know it does not go along with it. And so it, like, runs at him, and in the time that the giant thing closes the distance, he is much, much better. You know, he's basically swapped, you know, change places. He swapped sizes of the two, and, yeah, you know, puts it in a, in a jar and, and blows it up. Let's see. And... And we get a very visual representation of, yeah, they put Tonami inside the mainframe, as they said they would. You know, he's he's in a giant computer with a fan and everything, and there's ones and zeros. Just, yeah. And then, for the second time this episode, we see this, you know, senior freaking citizen woman sitting in knitting. And... You know, she, she shushes him. We saw her when Fukuyama went to, to bed. So this is like she exists within the the his perception of the world, which you know, in, in part these machines. I know I'm not the only person who got a bit of a Darth Vader vibe once they're taking off the helmet, you know, and you you don't right away get a real good look at his face. You just see like skin and scarring and such. And let's see, right? And according to IMDb trivia, the director of this episode, Charlie McDowell, is the son of Malcolm McDowell, the star of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. So, yeah. Um, that is really, really cool, and he did a fantastic job. Like, talent runs in that family. It's, it, it, it doesn't just run, it like sprints. Oh, hey, it was John, John Hamm narrating. I thought I recognized that voice. I, I keep, like, almost seeing him and stuff. Like, everyone's telling me I should see John Hamm and stuff. I mean, he was fantastic in... He was in the town? Wow. Yeah, I guess I vaguely recall it. Yeah, 
you know, he was great in, in the town and the, um, ah, what's it called again? Um, Bad Times of the El Royale, you know, fantastic here, just, yeah. Um, I think that is everything that I had to say, but yeah, um, fantastic episode. I'm gonna try to do the next one tomorrow, and yeah, really loving this show.